Speaker. After 14 years, we needed a sober and serious plan to revive our economy, boost productivity, encourage entrepreneurship and investment to power serious economic growth. We needed budget, budget for growth. Instead, what did we get? Reckless gimmicks and political trickery. When the country is crying out for renewal and investment in public services, this budget is putting party before nation. After 14 years of Conservative, the Conservative Party in power, our economy has been wrecked and vandalised. Before yesterday's tinkering around the edges, we knew public debt as a share of national output is at the highest since the 60s. Debt interest payments are the highest level since the Second World War. The economy is smaller per capita than when the Prime Minister took, on, took over after the mini-budget fiasco in which his predecessor, with the, with the chan then-Chancellor, crashed the economy. And this Parliament will be the first ever, Madam Deputy Speaker, whereby living standards as a measure of real household disposable income fell. <laughs> And now the Conservatives expect us to rejoice in their planned expenditure of nine billion of tax cuts that's going to be funded by increased borrowing. And this is going to be dwarfed by £27 billion of tax rises that came into effect last year and a further £19 billion that's due to come after the election because of the choices and decisions they have made. And when we look at the impact on different groups, research by the Women's Budget Group shows that single men will gain on average close to £500 more a year than lone mothers from the combined cuts of national insurance in the autumn statement and spring budget. And the Institute for Public Policy Research estimates that half of the tax cuts will go to the wealthiest households and just 3% to the poorest. We also heard the Chancellor boost boast yesterday of the Conservative Party's intentions to scrap national insurance altogether. Without any plans to fund this, this would leave a £46 billion black hole in the country's finances every year. This is deeply irresponsible. One would have thought that the Conservative Party had learnt the lessons having crashed the economy over with the mini-budget omni-shambles, which cost with their £45 billion of unfunded tax cuts, leading us to all pay a very high price, particularly in terms of costs as well as in mortgage hikes. And people are still living through that crisis, while the former Prime Minister goes off and earns a huge amount of money uh, dining out on having crashed the economy and living in denial. <laughs> This is why my, my right honourable friend, the Shadow Chancellor, has committed to upholding and strengthening the role of the Office of, the budge, of Budget Responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Only with Labour my, my can deliver the economic stability, I will give way in a minute, stability this country desperately needs and put an end to the Conservative Party's fantasy of unfunded, unsustainable tax cuts. The f I'll give way to my honourable friend. I, I just wonder on that point if the, there's any scope for a special crash the economy tax so that we could claw back yeah. some of the money she's earned as a result of her speaking yeah, yeah. to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, for, a start, for a start, she could certainly donate what she's earning to the millions of children who are now living in poverty, worsened by her crashing the economy. Children in my constituency have their parents having to do even more, more work in order to make ends meet, in order to pay mortgages that have doubled in some cases. And that is the consequence of the rot that she set by crashing the economy with her then Chancellor. I give way to my honourable friend. On a more serious note, I mean, there, there are uh, reports, uh, that it's, and it's alleged, that, um, that the then Chancellor briefed certain hedge fund managers ahead of that budget, and they made significant financial gains off the back of that. Surely there should be some comeback on that. Well, my honourable friend makes a very important point, and it was, it was well publicised at the time, and it's shocking that there hasn't been an investigation or an inquiry into what happened at that point. And what is shocking is that the then Chancellor and 
the then Prime Minister continue to behave like they did nothing wrong, yeah. continue to behave like we should be grateful yeah. that they were in charge at the time, continue to go on speaking circuits, gaslighting the British public, having crashed the economy and ruined their lives, and we are still paying for that. So the time can't come soon enough for this episode to be over, for a fresh start with a new government, a Labour government. The former Treasury Minister, David Gork, in, a, a, in a, an article in the New Statement, said about the current Chancellor and his budget, this budget is a work, was a work of fiction. He wants to be prudent and responsible, and he wants to cut taxes. The reality is he can't do both. That, Madam Deputy Speaker, is about the current Chancellor's uh, decisions. Now, I have a lot of time for the current Chancellor. He inherited an awful situation, but he hasn't faced up to the reality of needing to be responsible. And his colleague, previous co his colleague uh, sets this out in this piece. It's not the Labour Party attacking the decisions of the current Chancellor. It's his own former colleague who was a respected Treasury Minister. And when it comes to growth, Madam Deputy Speaker, you don't need to, one doesn't need to be an economist to know their economic policy is failing. Wages have fallen behind, and according to the Resolution Foundation, real wages will only return to 2008 levels by 2026. That's nearly two decades of lost pay growth. That's two decades of people not seeing an improvement in their living standards. Two decades, almost two decades, of having to face real terms wage cuts. By contrast, real wages growth, real wage growth across the OECD as a whole has risen by almost 9% on average over the same period. That's costing British workers an average of £3,600 per year. And, with that, and they have, it means they've had less to spend, and on top of that, they've had to live through the spectre of the mini-budget crisis made in Downing Street and the cost-of-living crisis that came after that. The House of Commons Library shows that the UK food and alcoholic drink prices were nearly 7% higher in January 2024 compared with the previous year because of the CPI measures of inflation. And what does that mean in practice? In constituencies like mine and up and down the country, it means many more children living in poverty. Millions more children living in poverty during the course of the last 14 years. Children in this country going hungry because of the failures of this government. Parents having to work more hours to just keep up and keep their head, heads above water. That is the consequence, consequence of what the Conservatives have got done to people's lives in this country. This budget also leaves those who earn £19,000 or less worse off. That cannot be right. The Office of Budget Responsibility for Forecasts show that the, the GDP will grow by just 0.78% in 2024 and 1.8% in 2025. And what about productivity? The government has talked about the productivity puzzle for a very long time, but it hasn't managed to address it. In the quarter 2023, productivity was estimated to be 0.3% lower compared to the year before. Uh, according to the Office of National Statistics. So what we have and what we've had is sluggish productivity, flatlining growth, stagnant wages, rising prices. No wonder our country is in recession. This government has provide, presided over, as a consequence, declining <coughs> investment in our public services. We've seen the spectre of queues for dentist appointments, people stuck in hospitals because of the failure to invest in local government, in social care, the police struggling to cope because of underfunding and cuts in police numbers, the criminal justice system facing massive cuts, 
and as a result, people are not getting justice. Major infrastructure projects cancelled, like HS2, which means that investors have lost confidence. And there is so much more. I could go on, but I appreciate others will want to speak. So the question is, do people feel better? Better off than they did in 2010 when the Conservative Party came into government? No, the answer is no, because they are working longer hours, they're working harder, and after austerity, which damaged our public services and the mini-budget crisis that crashed our economy and that has cost, to begin with, 60 billion, along with mortgage increases, food price hikes, and much else, people aren't better off. And of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, we haven't mentioned Partygate, the abuse of power, the billions wasted in PPE contracts, money wasted in fraud that could have, but the billions that we could have used to support people. Instead, it went to waste and it went into, in, in particular cases, into corruption that hasn't been addressed. And what we've seen is an endless, endless queue of chancellors and prime ministers, one after another, uh, experimenting on our country and letting people down. Political instability and economic instability causing huge distress to people's lives in our country. What do they have to show for it? A cost of living crisis often made in Downing Street and a sticking plaster budget designed to help the Conservative Party remain in power. But people can see right through it. They're not going to be fooled by what's been provided. What we need is a serious budget for productivity and growth. What we need is no more wasting opportunities, no more wasting people's talents. What we need is a government focused on national renewal. What we need is an economic strategy for growth that we didn't get yesterday. We could have had a sustainable uh, program for supporting small and medium-sized businesses that power our economy. 99% of our economy, uh, our businesses are in that sector. Uh, where they could be supported much more to grow our economy. We could have seen uh, much more support for uh, those who are in the home building, uh, home building industry by reforming the planning system. We could have seen more investment for the green industries and generating green jobs, a new national wealth fund to unlock billions in, the pri in private investment, a skills revolution, in the form of setting up new technical excellence colleges uh, and investment in, uh, in the young, uh, younger generation in their skills and education in early years. We could have seen a shift in making work pay with a genuine living wage, banning zero hours contracts and ending firing, fire and rehire. That is, those are some of the things the country desperately needs. We've seen none of that. We've seen no vision for the future, for renewing our economy and our society. That's what we will deliver. Those are some of the things we could deliver, would deliver, if we have the privilege of getting into government. It's time for change. It's time to end this misery and destruction being caused by this government. Uh, and it's time for a change in government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey.